In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. This week, in just a few days, we will come to the Feast of the Ascension. Traditionally, the Ascension is celebrated liturgically in the Church exactly 40 days after Easter. And so traditionally, it's celebrated on Thursday, Ascension Thursday. In some places in the world, in many dioceses, it's been moved to the following Sunday. In any event, it's right around this time that our Lord's time on the earth in his resurrected form comes to an end. And in the presence of his disciples, in the presence of his apostles and disciples, he ascends into heaven. He ascends to the Father. And the different accounts of this, if we bring them to our prayer, can help us to reflect on and appreciate more different aspects of our relationship with Christ. It will help us open our minds and hearts to different ways that Christ is still active in heaven, still helping us from heaven. We can use our imagination to put ourselves into the scene of the ascension. Along with the other disciples, our Lord has summoned us to a special place, to a high place, a mount, outside of Jerusalem, near the town of Bethany. We can read from the Gospel of St. Luke to put ourselves into the scene and to enter into this time of prayer. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. Lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And to bless someone, of course, is a special action. It's a special prayer. To bless is to implore God's special favor for that person being blessed, for that object being blessed. To bless someone or something is also to sanctify that person in a certain way, or that object. To set it aside for God, to make it belong to God. And the most powerful blessing is God's own blessing. To have God's blessing is to have His favor. It's to have a guarantee of His goodwill towards us. It's to have His support. It's to belong to Him. Sometimes people express their favor, their agreement, precisely in this way. If a child is thinking about getting married or engaged, his or her parents may say, you have our blessing, or you have my blessing, which means I support you in this, I'm behind you in this, I will help you in this endeavor. I'm on your side. I'm with you. And right from the beginning of humanity, God has blessed us. He's blessed his children, his creatures. In the book of Genesis, we read that God blessed Adam and Eve. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Later on, in the same book of Genesis, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you shall rest on every animal of the earth and on every bird of the air, on everything that creeps on the ground and on all the fish of the sea. 
and into your hands they are delivered. And so the blessing of God brings with it this wish for, for fruitfulness, for abundance, for sustenance. It's a sign of God's favor during our life. And so what a wonderful thing it is to see, Lord, in our prayer, that the last thing you do on earth is to bless your disciples. And through them, of course, you bless all of us. You bless all of your disciples of all time. And your blessing, Lord, continues as you ascend into heaven, such that the last thing our Lord does on earth, imparting us this blessing, becomes the first thing that he does in heaven. The first act of our Lord in heaven is to bless us, is to bestow his favor on us, is to, is to wish us well and tell us that he's on our side. Christ's blessing of us from heaven, your blessing of us, Lord, for, from heaven, is, in a manner of speaking, doubled by his Father, backed up by his Father. Because we're blessed in Christ, God the Father blesses us. There's an incredible passage from the beginning of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which describes this. St. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so St. Paul here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, uses this wonderful language of abundance, of generosity, of totality, kind of overkill, right? an overdoing of the whole thing in God's bestowing grace upon us. He says we have every spiritual blessing to the praise of of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us. We enjoy the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. And above all, the greatest blessing is that he destined us for adoption as his children. We become children of God. And what, what father does not want to favor his children? What father is not on his children's side? What father does not want to see his children blessed and fortunate? And so this is the first message that we can take from the Ascension in our Lord's presence. This powerful reality, we have Christ's blessing. And because we're blessed in Christ, we have the blessing of God the Father. We have their favor. We have their wish for our, our well-being, for our, good, our goodness. And we can remind ourselves of this, perhaps, whenever we attend benediction with the Blessed Sacrament. To be blessed by the Blessed Sacrament and benediction is to be blessed by Christ, is to receive the blessing of Christ, the same blessing that, that he poured out upon the world on the day of the Ascension. Why is it the same? Because as, as the letter to the Hebrews tells us, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so as our Lord left this earth blessing us, as he entered heaven blessing us, he continues to do so today, both in, in benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, through the blessings of the church, through the blessings of the priests. Our Lord blesses us in so many ways. In the Gospel of Mark, we have this short account of the Ascension. So then the Lord Jesus, Mark writes, So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of God. And the right hand of God is a very rich image in the Bible. 
God's right hand is a symbol of God's power. It's a symbol of his victory over all his enemies. And so to say that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, as we profess in the Apostles' Creed, that he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, is to say that he shares in God's power. He shares in the Father's victory over evil, which is to say, in, in a particular way, that Christ really was the Messiah. It's also to say that he's the object of God's special favor, because to sit at the right hand of the king was to sit in a place of favor, of predilection. And this is why um, in, in Jesus' account of the Last Supper, the sheep go to the right hand and the goats go to the left hand. Right? The sheep, of course, are those destined for heaven, and the goats are, des are those um, destined for separation from God who go to the left hand. And so to be seated at the right hand of God the Father is to be in a place of power, is to be in a place of, of love, is to be in a place of favor, is to be in a place of victory. We read about the right hand of God in, among many other places in the prophet Isaiah. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. So Isaiah, God speaking through the prophet, says, I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. There we see the right hand as a symbol of victory. We see the same thing in, in the book of Exodus. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. He picked off His picked officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. And so these are good considerations for us to take to our dialogue with our Lord, the power of God, the victorious nature of God. St. Josemaria liked to say that God does not lose battles. And so Christ sitting at God's right hand, Christ on the right hand of God the Father, reminds us of this, that this power of God is for us. This power of God is on our side. This power and this victorious nature of God works wonders in our own battles, in our personal battles. God does not lose battles. St. Paul says something similar in, the, in, in his letter to the Romans. If God is for us, who is against us? If God is for us, who is against us? Psalm 27, we have the beautiful line. It's very beautiful in Latin. Dominus illuminatio me et salus me, quem timebo. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And in another psalm we read, Dominus protector vitae me, a quo trepidabo. The Lord is my life's guardian. Of, of what shall I be afraid? These are great questions that um, come to our prayer that we can use in times of anxiety in times of fear, in times of uncertainty. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my life's guardian. Of what should I be afraid? Whom shall I fear? What should make me afraid? Recently, I was watching this very popular series on the life of our Lord and the life of the apostles called Chosen. It was recommended to me by many people before I actually <laughs> ventured to look at it. I'm always way behind on my mm, cultural, uh, pop culture mm, consumption. In any event, it came out, I think it came out last year, but it's been, uh, it's been more, more popular during this time of, um, of uh, confinement when people have more time to watch these things. 
in any event, it's it's um, it's it's very beautiful and it's an interesting portrayal of of uh, different characters in in our Lord's life. And one of the characters there we see is Mary Magdalene, and Mary Magdalene has these flashbacks to um, being with her father, and her father has had her memorize a very beautiful verse from um, from the book of the prophet Isaiah. It's Isaiah forty three verse one. And um, it shows her as a little girl and she can't sleep because she's scared. And the father says, okay, what do we do when we're scared? And what they do is pray. What they do is recite this verse. And then later on, uh, when Mary Magdalene is um, this public sinner and possessed and in a very bad way, she returns to this prayer and she tries to pray it. And so this is Isaiah 43, one. But now... This is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And so these are great. These are great um, verses for us in times of in times of uncertainty, in times of worry, in times of fear. If God is for us, who is against us? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my life's guardian. Of what shall I be afraid? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. And this command, this command, not to fear, is something that runs right through the whole Bible. Pope Francis has mentioned, um, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, on, in, during his um, catechesis on hope, he mentioned an interesting, an interesting fact. He said that, that um, this exhortation, right, don't be afraid or fear not, occurs 365 times in the Bible. 365 times. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit tells us, don't be afraid. We hear it, of course, from our Lord's own lips in different different times in the gospel. He says, fear not, fear not only believe. You have little faith, why were you afraid? Etc. etc. So the Pope pointed out that this is this is um, something that God really stresses in Revelation. Right? Fear not. Why? Because God is our Father, because God loves us, because God blesses us because God is truly on our side, is truly taking care of us. And so for every day of the year, there is a verse in which God tells us, don't be afraid, fear not. So we have this um, second aspect of the ascension. The first is the fact that God blesses us in the ascension and continues to bless us in Christ. The second is this, this reality, this powerful image of Christ seated at God's right hand, seated at the right hand of the Father. And then we can ask ourselves, well, what is Christ doing in heaven? What is he doing at the Father's right hand? And one of the amazing things our faith teaches us is that Christ intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. He appeals to the Father on our behalf. He especially appeals to Him for mercy. He especially appeals to Him for leniency with our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins. He asks the Father to have mercy on us. Again, we read in in St. Paul, writing to the Romans, Paul writes, Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Right? And so Paul says no one can condemn us because Christ Jesus intercedes for us at the right hand of God. In the letter to the Hebrews, we have a similar passage. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And he always lives to make intercession for them. This is what Christ is living for in heaven to intercede for us. This is 
how he's using his eternity until the world ends, made for our good on our behalf. And one of the ways in which, in which Christ performs this intercession is by showing the Father the wounds of his passion. We considered at Easter time that our Lord, with his resurrected body, still has, mysteriously, still has the wounds of the passion. The apostles see the holes in his hand and his feet made by the nails. They see the opening in his side made by the lance, the spear. And our Lord wants them to see them. He says, behold, my hands and my feet. And to Thomas, he says, hey, put your finger here and touch, touch the hole in my hand. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. And so what's the point of, of those wounds? Why does he have those wounds? St. Thomas Aquinas, citing um, St. Bede the Venerable, says this, that one of the reasons that Christ has those wounds is so that when he pleads for us with the Father, he may always show the manner of death he endured for us. And so you, Lord, are in heaven, but you're in heaven with your resurrected body, and your resurrected body bears the wounds of your love for us. And those wounds move the Father to have compassion on us. The wounds are a reminder to the Father of how much the Father himself loves us. God so loved the world that he gave up. He gave his only son. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Jesus loved us with a love beyond all telling. Greater love than this has no man than to give his life for his friends. And so when God the Father sees God the Son, he sees those wounds. He's reminded of how much value we have for him. He's reminded of how much value the Son has put in us, of how much has been invested in us in the Passion. And so this is a great mystery. It's a wonderful mystery that the risen life of Christ, the eternal life of Christ, Christ's life in heaven, has somehow incorporated his suffering, has incorporated his death. There's an amazing line in the in the church's liturgy in the third preface of Easter, which says this, He never ceases to offer himself for us, but defends us and ever pleads our cause before you. He is the sacrificial victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever. And so here the church envisions Christ as in heaven offering himself continually to the Father for us. He never ceases to offer himself for us, but defends us and ever pleads our cause before you. Who's that you? Of course, the, the prayer, like most of the liturgy, is directed to God the Father. He is the sacrificial victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever. And the original Latin is very suggestive um, and it's very powerful. The English says, the lamb once slain who lives forever. And the, um, the Latin actually says, Agnus qui semper vivit ocisus, the lamb who lives forever slain. Right? The lamb who lives slain forever. And so it's not like, okay, he was dead, but now he's alive. Um, the mystery and uh, the nuance here is in this idea that he lives slain. And this is a, um, another way of getting at the mystery that the wounds of our Lord are present in his, in his body. He's fine, but he still has the wounds. They've been turned into his trophies. And so when our Lord ascends into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, he reminds the Father of how much he loves us. And what reminds the Father of how much he loves us? The fact that he lives slain, that he lives with the mortal wounds. And so we can thank our Lord for, for 
our redemption. We can thank our Lord for the wonderful, mysterious way that he's redeemed us, dying on the cross. We thank our Lord for being present in heaven and interceding for us with the Father. And one final thing that we can reflect on in the ascension is is our Lord's going to heaven so that we can go to heaven. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 14, we read this. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And so this is another thing that we can um, take to our prayer today, that Jesus is in heaven so that we can be in heaven. He's in heaven preparing a place for each one of us. Jesus is active in heaven. He's interceding for us and he's getting heaven ready for us. And it's not he's not just there watching us. He says, I will come again to take you to myself. He intervenes in our journey towards heaven. We wouldn't be welcome in heaven without the ascension. We wouldn't be welcome in heaven if our Lord hadn't gone ahead of us. It's kind of like perhaps you've had the experience of showing up at a social function or a party and not knowing anyone there. And maybe one friend has invited you. And so you kind of frantically look around to see if Uh, If you can find that person or find someone you know. Well, this is heaven. And the person we know, the person who's expecting us, is Jesus Christ. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And so we look around for the host, right? We look around for the one who invited us. Jesus in the gospel says, Rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your names are written in heaven. And so if heaven is like a great party, a great banquet, once we get there, we just like in a wedding reception at times, you know, we have our names, our name tags on this table. Our names are written there. And because they're written there, because we can put on that tag, we belong in heaven. And Jesus has written your name in heaven and my name in heaven because he died for us on the cross. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for going to heaven to prepare this place. And help me always to live hoping in you, not trying to get there on my own, but relying on your help because you're interceding for me, because you're blessing me, because you're coming to me to take me where you are. And so this gives us a great uh, perspective on which to think about our own death, right, the death of a Christian is not an end, it's the beginning of it's the beginning of eternal life. As long as we stay faithful to our Lord, as long as we're sorry for our sins, as long as we try to avail ourselves of all the means of grace and the sacraments that our Lord has has given to us, we shouldn't be afraid of death. We have a natural fear of death, of course, but in the light of our faith, we shouldn't be afraid of death. For your loved ones, O Lord, the church's liturgy says, For your loved ones, O Lord, life is not changed. Life is not ended, but changed. Life is not ended, but changed. Vita non tolitor sed mutator. In the Latin, life is not taken away, but rather it's transformed. For your holy ones, O Lord, in their death, life is not taken away, but transformed. We go to Our Lady. Our Lord, once he gets to heaven, one of the first things that he wants to do is get his mother there. And he wants his mother as she really is, with her body, not just her spirit, not just her soul. He wants her with her body. And so he um, so he takes her to himself in the assumption. Our Lady's assumption into heaven, body and soul is a kind of parallel to our Lord's ascension, body and soul into heaven. And so what our Lord is doing in heaven, interceding for us, 
blessing us, preparing a place for us. Our Lady, our Mother Mary, helps him to do that. She's the Queen of Heaven. Right? She has the run of the house. And so we go to her. Our Lady, Queen of Heaven, help us to contemplate Christ in Heaven, loving us, welcoming us, wanting us to be there. And help us to live in such a way that we come to see him there and you on that day when Jesus calls us to himself. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect, my Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.